Good morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. Uh, this must be like the graveyard shift after all of the parties last night. So we appreciate seeing some bums on seats because it will be very lonely in the big room without you all here. So we're going to talk a little bit about uh, support, providing support as a service, why we think it's a great idea, and um, hopefully have a little bit of fun along the way. We have the coolest thing that I've seen all conference here. These are microphones, so if anybody wants to butt in and ask a question, feel free, because we can throw these on their light and soft. So please do jump in if you feel the need. Um, we do reserve the right to try and keep things moving along because we have a fair bit of material we'd like to share, so we don't want to spend too long diverting off um, answering questions, but we will try and facilitate any questions that come along the way. Um, so so yeah. I guess a first a bit about ourselves. So I'm Stella, I'm the Managing Director of Anertech. It's a digital agency based out of Ireland. And I'm Anthony, I lead the support team. Yeah. So um, at Anertech, we love support. So that might be a bit of a, this is the normal reaction that we get when we say that. Um, but yeah, we do, and it's a large part of our business. To give you a bit of a, a background to it, currently we have about seven people on the support team. We have 40 clients and over 60 sites, all on our retainer support model. But I don't know, when was it? It was about 2013. When did this all come into being? When did we realize that support was really important to our business? In 2013, at DrupalCon Prague, we run a large project. At the time, there was only six people in the company. And it was one of those projects that was either going to sink us or grow us. It was like all or nothing. So it was like, we have lots of existing clients. They're quite needy. Uh, but needy in a good way, because we love them. Yes, yes, needy in a good way. So it was, what do we do? So we put five of the company on the new project, and we gave Anthony everybody else. <laughs> so things have kind of grown from there. Uh, as Stella said, it's now a team of seven, and we're still trying to grow the team. We're hiring, um, by the way. Yeah, if anybody feels the need, uh, please do make yourselves known. <laughs> um, and yeah, it, we came to the realization that Without providing a de dedicated support service, we were just leaving money on the table. From a purely business point of view, there's clients there with needs, and they want your help, and it might not be big enough for a full-blown project. It might not be big enough to go through the whole procurement process, but it's regular, incremental, to give you an idea of just what we're talking about here, the support team in our business is a third of our company and our revenue is over a third from the support team alone. So that is regular recurring revenue. So it allows us to have that stable base and to go after new clients and new projects. So what are some of the other benefits? Well, I find that because you're in contact with your clients every day, more or less, you're building the relationship all the time. So when they actually have a big chunk of work, they're more likely to come directly to you. So the cost of sale drops dramatically. If, for example, there's a tender that comes out for a big, juicy government website, it costs a lot of money to create the proposal, to go through the arduous tender process, a lot of time, a lot of effort. But in the world of support, you're getting business all the time. And when they 
want a new widget, they just come to you. When they want a shop, maybe you have to price that, but they just come to you. And you're constantly building trust with the client, which just pays dividends all the time. Yeah, it, it really does. Like, um, okay, you're coming to you with new projects and, and new bits and pieces, but we can also go to them. We can say, we might have a lull and say our UX team where we need, you know, we don't have a new, enough work possibly in our pipeline where we forecast that's happening. We can go sell a client a UX audit and actually drum up more work that way. And it works really well to fill those gaps in the main project teams. Yeah, there's lots of opportunity. Um, and we'll talk about this a bit later when we come to talk about billing. But there's lots of opportunity to, well, make more money out of it through that approach of being proactive and seeing a need that the client has and then making the case for it. So what do we mean by support? Well, my day-to-day -day could touch 20 projects and it could be anything from rescuing a disaster where on more than one occasion, people have deleted user accounts and then seen all of their content vanish. Or, uh, oh, I don't know, somebody's deleted a database or their server has exploded. So all of that sort of recovery from disaster. But it might be, I want a call to action button. Or it might be, I'm really not sure that I'm using features right. Can we have a chat? and you can talk me through it. It's everything from, I want a friendly voice at the end of the phone through to, help me, I'm about to die. Yeah, so we do provide sort of help desk support, as in, how can I edit this page? Or can you edit this page for me? That's actually at the rare end. Most of it is, we want a new feature, or yeah, I've deleted all my content. Help. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then there's um, other things. There's, um, there's many projects. Yeah, so again, this, this ties in neatly to different ways of billing because as a standard, we like to keep it simple. And at the, the initial phone call where I'm introducing people to how we work, I like to say, you're just buying time. I don't care how you use it. I'm, I've got your back. I'm there for you. So if you want to chat or you want a widget, that's fine. But sometimes, particularly with larger pieces of work, clients want certainty, or maybe their, their businesses require uh, certain dates to be met, or certain bags of money not to be exceeded. So they, the client will always have a, desi a desired future state. They want to be somewhere, to get somewhere. And, and they normally, don't want to take any of the risk. Pardon? And they don't want to take any of the risk. Indeed, they, they don't to want to take any risk. Done. But normally we charge by the hour because it's easy. Easy for us, easy for them but then there is more risk. So with a mini project, so something maybe 50 to 100 hours, so it's not big enough for a build team, but it's bigger than you might normally do in a month for one client. They can, or rather, we have the opportunity to offer them, uh, they can buy a mitigation against risk, if that makes sense. So if they want something by a given date, we have to ring fence resources for that. That costs. There's value to be had in the certainty that the project will be delivered by next Thursday. If they want uh, a fixed price, there's value in the certainty of that fixed price, and it's more expensive. But 
people do appreciate the value of that certainty. Whereas, as easy as paying by the hour is, it can sometimes make people a little nervous when you're talking about 50 or 100 hours. But there's an opportunity there for us. Yeah, and often we we'll deal with corporations who we're dealing with the media team or the IT team, and they're quite happy with the by the hour, but they've got to present the case internally to the different business units in the organization, and they're not. They just want a price and a time, and that's it. So the support team does have the agility and the flexibility to take on those larger pieces of work that are too small for the project teams, but still larger than the normal, regular monthly support that we would normally give them. But then there is also planned work and unplanned work. And, and emer emergency work. And emergency work. So planned work is where you would sit down with the client at the start of the month and you'd go, right, here's your backlog. What are the priorities for this month? What do you want to get done? We have so many hours. Let's do it. Whereas unplanned work. Well, unplanned work is, that tends to come after you've done the planning with the client and you're go going to do a widget on Monday, and then on Thursday, we're going to get rid of some rubbish, that's legacy code maybe. But then Monday afternoon, they go, ooh, I saw a thing on another site. Can we have that? And then somebody from marketing comes on and goes, oh, actually, no, I want this thing too. So they've all got these conflicting priorities now, and it's important to be able to push back to the client to go, which do you want first? We, sure, we can do these, but I won't have this done for Thursday <laughs> if you want these other things. So that's unplanned work. And then emergency work is help. I've deleted something, or payments aren't working, or... Or there's a bot attacking our site. Yeah, 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 we're seeing a lot of bots attacking sites lately. It's also, to a degree, would be security updates. They're somewhat planned, as in, you know, on a Wednesday evening, there's possibly security updates coming out, and sometimes there's a public service announcement. But, you know, it's, it's still something that you have to schedule in. You can reserve time for it, but it's something that has to be done, but may not happen, actually. So it's, it can be fun to try and manage all of these uh, disparate pressures, I suppose. Um, and the way we tend to do it is through a combination of Trello for the nice visual interface. We use a Trello board per client, and we use a Slack equivalent called Rocket that takes uh, notifications from each Trello board. So any new card that's created, any new comment that's created, it goes through the flow of communication that we use every day. So we're able to stay on top of what's happening. Um, and we recently introduced the concept of a sweeper role because if everybody is looking at Rocket Chat all the time, looking at all of these notifications, you're constantly being bombarded with information and you're context switching all the time. So we decided to have a rota, I suppose. One person every week, their job is to stay on top of Rocket and to look after new cards leaving everybody else to look after all of the stuff they're already doing. And that has been a huge success because if it's not your turn, you can just ignore all of the new cards until somebody brings something specifically to your attention because it's your skill set or your favorite client or they're stuck and they need your help. So it's simply about minimizing distractions and allowing work to get completed rather than a whole bunch of different tickets being started and none of them actually getting across the line. 
It's and it's, it's, it's a new concept for us. It's something we've only been trying out in the last few weeks, months. Yeah. Um, but it appears to be working so far. Similarly, we've banned the A ah here in Rocket, in Slack. So we're minimizing the number of distractions of just little queries that pop up. Another um, thing that we introduced really, or recently, um, this, is, this is less about minimizing context switching and distraction, but it segues nicely. We set up a private channel just for my team called the bat signal. And that's when you are working on a ticket and you're just stuck, you don't know where to go. So if you enter something into the bat signal, the rest of the team knows you're stuck and you need their help, but it's only used in emergencies. It's not for um, and only the support team are allowed queries. on it. I'm yeah. not allowed in there. So that's also working really well because you know there's a problem if anything happens in the bat signal channel. So uh, in terms of we, in terms of how we price this and how we build clients and how we work with them, uh, there's three different models that we use. So we already talked about the mini projects and how it's a fixed price quite often and it's a fixed time and they pay the the extra cost to get that fixed price. We're taking on the risk, so the cost is higher. And uh, most of the time, we make a profit. Sometimes, though, you, there is a risk that you don't. But then there's the clients who just want insurance, who just want somebody there at the other end of the phone, or the other end of the ticket system, or the other end of the email, just to be there and answer questions. They may not contact you but they may, and they see the value in that insurance and having somebody there. Um, and then there's somebody there, uh, Boris, wants, wants a question? I was wondering how much extra do you charge for the mitigating the risk? Is it any percentages? It kind of depends on the project, but yeah, it could be we do the estimate and then double it if we think there's a, a high volume of risk or we add on 20%. It, it depends on the project as to how much of the scope we are competent in, and also our history with that client in terms of how often they change the scope or want to change the scope. Uh, right, how well are they? Yeah. Then there is subscription. So most of our clients will be in a subscription module, model. So we have uh, set packages, bronze, silver, gold, and so on, where you get so many hours per month. At the very basic level, you just get support. There's no code, no anything. You just have somebody at the end of the line who can help you. At the other ones... Well, I'd just like to say that with the basics, you're meant to just get support and no development, but sometimes we sneak some in. I'm not sure I'm meant to know that. On the other packages, you do get ongoing development and new features and new widgets. And how much you get depends on how much, what level of support you've signed up to, how many hours you, you've subscribed to. Some people really don't care what the, ooh, okay, one, one moment. Some people don't care what package they've actually signed up to. They just don't want your time as often as they can get it. So they're nice clients to have. Wait, just to, just to continue on that, we have some clients who are on 16 hours per month and are doing 150. If you have uh, subscription uh, hours, what do you do with hours not used? Clients are allowed to roll over hours for a maximum, up to a maximum of their subscription. So say you have a contract for 16 hours per month and they use 10, then they have six that they can roll over. But the maximum they can roll over is 16. Okay. Again, the idea there is to keep it simple. But continuing on, like segue nicely from that actually is, how does the support team know how many hours a client has, how much has already been used, how much is left, and also whether the client is willing to go over their hours, like go to the 17 hours or the 25 hours or whatever it is beyond their subscription. So we've, you've It used to be easy. <clears throat> when it was just me doing it all, it was easy. 
but uh, now that it's grown, uh, basically we've had to automate everything that I used to do by hand on a spreadsheet. So we have reports set up that all the team can access that shows all the clients, how many hours they've subscribed to, how many we've done, how many are left, and percentages, and color codes, and it's a thing of beauty. I don't know why I didn't do it years ago, because it saves me so much work. So between that, and I have set up a, a sort of a board of Trello boards so that you can see every client and each column in their Trello boards and how many cards are in each one. So it's easy to see if there's cards waiting for deployment. Sometimes they get forgotten about or cards sitting in QA that need to be unstuck and need to get deployed or a nice healthy backlog. So you can quite quickly figure out who has work, who has hours, and um, get going, doing stuff, helping people. Yeah, and seeing what is there to be done, and also seeing where the bottlenecks are. Quite often the bottleneck is in UAT, where the customer needs to sign off on it. But um, the other thing that often arises is with clients that the, they want to know where their hours are being spent. So, Similarly to how we've built that report or dashboard of the different hours and the time remaining for each client, we've integrated our timekeeping system with Drupal. So we've been able to create all these customer reports and we've created a customer dashboard. So the customers can log in and see a dashboard of all their hours and they can go back and they can query last month, this month, custom time period. So that's a huge time saver as well because you're not constantly asked what did you do last week? Can I get a timesheet report for last month? Um, it's all there. Along with, and it'd be interesting actually to find out whether clients use this information. I've got statistics on how many cards get done a month and how much effort cards typically take. Um, I use it all the time for forecasting. Um, so when clients go, how long is this going to take when they've just asked for a, a ticket and I haven't even looked at it? I can go, on average, it takes two and a half hours to do a card. So it's going to probably take two and a half hours. And that makes them happy. Because that's what it's all about, keeping them happy. So it doesn't really matter in one way whether the website works once the customer is happy, right? So how do you keep them happy? <clears throat> Foot rubs. <laughs> Um, I say that jokingly, but in effect, foot rubs, they want to feel loved, they want to know that you've got, your, got their back, they want to know that in an emergency they can come to you and you'll make their problems go away. That's the core of it. Um, the, the core of it is communication. You have to communicate with your clients, communicate regularly. When a ticket comes in, you need to respond and say, we're on it. Or we'll be, you know, that's lower priority. You know, we'll deal with your other higher priority tickets first. They just need to know that it's been looked at and somebody is on it. And regular updates afterwards, of course. Yeah, it um, is, it's very easy to jump on each new ticket and respond to the customer and go, yes, we're on it and then forget about that ticket because another one has come in. Yes, we're <laughs> on it. And you end up spinning 200 plates uh, with all of these new tickets. And that's where the sweeper role we spoke about earlier really comes into play because the sweeper is doing that response, is doing that initial triage, and then either completing the ticket or handing it to someone to get over the line and it makes completion a lot easier um, because until it's complete, it's dead work. So then there's, um, I want to move on to talk about standardization. That's a good one. <laughs> so we have over 60 sites across different 
clients. We have projects that are on Drupal 7 that we built. Then we changed how we were building Drupal 7 sites, because Drupal 7 was around quite a while. So we've got different ways of building Drupal 7 sites, and now we have Drupal 8. And then we also have the rescue projects, the, the projects that somebody else built and no longer wants to support, or maybe the relationship between the vendor and the customer broke down, and we have to take over that, and there are a whole world of special snowflakes. So how do you manage that? <clears throat> right, so managing all that is hard. So we've got, I don't know, seven different hosting platforms um, including some self-hosted sites and six different VPN solutions and a million different code bases and modules and it is a lot to get your head around. So we try and standardize as much as possible. We have a thing that we call housekeeping. At the start of every support project, we identify the things that just need to be done now so getting modules up to date, getting, say, uh, hosting environment configuration, just so, all of the, so that we have access to all of the tools that we expect in our daily work so that it can make dealing with all of the special snowflakes easier. When we do take over uh, somebody else's website, somebody else has built, uh, we do a site audit. So this is sort of a productized solution that we, we sell them. So we do two, three days of reviewing their website, how it's been constructed, what modules they're using. We do a security review. We look at all the custom code, all the weird configurations and module combinations that you're, they're using, and we produce a report. And we crack, crack, uh, classify in the report whether this is critical, we need to look at this now, or whether this is low priority, it's just information for you to know about your website. And from there, we're able to sit down with the client, discuss with them their needs and what they want to achieve with the website, and also discuss what we need to do in terms of housekeeping and to get it to a, a stable place that we can continue to support it without too much hassle. And that creates a nice backlog when the customer comes on board. And then we discuss with them priorities and how to move forward. The difficulties arise when you have a client who has limited budget per month, but they have a disaster of a website, so you have a backlog as long as your arm of things that really need to be done. But they also want a new widget, and maybe this widget, maybe it's a payment system or something, and it's going to take multiples of months to get finished. We have learned over the time that it's really important to prioritize the remedial work before you get involved in any complex new stuff. Because otherwise, the new stuff just takes longer. It's more full of bugs, bugs that you didn't create. Things um, you're going to have to refactor again later. Yeah, yeah, you're building work. The problem is that technical debt arrives in spades on, um, on inherited projects. Legacy code and technical debt, it's like radioactive waste. You can measure its half-life in years, and it doesn't go away unless you bury it in concrete or burn it with fire. I like the burning. Burning is good. But the client doesn't always see the benefit because it isn't obvious. It's not a shiny new widget. You're digging up buried bodies, essentially. Um, but it is important to try and communicate and educate the client on why this is important and what they're get actually getting and how it will save them time and money later on. Um, it can be a very difficult line to tread between you have all these problems, and we're going to fix them. And the last agency sucked. You know, you don't want to badmouth anybody, but essentially you're badmouthing them just because you're showing all of the corpses that they have in their code base. 
So and you have to be nice about it. Yeah, and often clients uh, do feel quite burned. Like when they come from another agency where the relationship is broken down, they're feeling quite burnt and by the relationship. And they, it takes time to build that trust up with the new client to show you're not going to be the same, you're going to communicate, you're going to actually respond to their tickets and you know, address their concerns. But it is something that we have to work through that show them that they are loved. <laughs> A nice quick win, uh, like if, if you want to build trust quicker, um, I have found, sure, maybe there's a load of remedial work that needs to be done, that's got invisible evils that need to be solved. But if you can do something like give them a paragraph that lets them uh, embed a YouTube video, you know, or uh, give them a new call to action button, something that is shiny and do that quickly, straight off the bat, then they get impressed and they trust you more and then you can talk about let's fix a load of and stuff. And something that they can show their boss or their CEO and oh, you know, we've been asking this for this for months and we've got it already. Just by simply changing agency, you know, it does, it does help that relationship and bond. I'm conscious of time is moving on and I do want to talk about team. I'm glad. <laughs> so, Support isn't for everyone. Uh, there's a lot of context switching involved. So you're working with clients, like 40 different clients who have anything from four hours to 32 to way more than 32 hours per month. And there is a lot of juggling, a lot of different types of tasks, different projects, Drupal 7, Drupal 8, different hosting environments. So yeah, it's not for everybody. And it does require experience. Um, you can't just join the support team as a junior developer because there's just so many different combinations. It, it's just, yeah, you have to have experience in order to join the team and be able to get into the, the investigation work, the detective work. Yeah, um, a large part of it is interrogating the client. I like to call it badgering the witness. Oh, we have a question. I was just wondering, uh, with the context switching, how do you build that into your uh, billing and planning? Because, you know, sometimes when you have to switch, you said up to 20 times per one day. Now, that's he extreme, but yeah. I, I understand, but th that's sometimes my job too. But how do you build it into your billing? Because it sometimes context switching can take a while just just to go from one and to the next, even though what you're doing literally took two minutes. We always, we always round up to the nearest 15 minutes. So if something takes two minutes, it actually took 15. Um, so that, that's sort of built in by design. Mm -hmm. um, I like to think I'm good <laughs> at context switching. I know nobody is really, but. You're better than most. <laughs> I'm okay at it. Uh, I know some of my team aren't that good at it, so I try and shield them uh, from it by steering them towards chunkier pieces of work, something they can concentrate on for a day or half a day at a time. But a lot of the necessary context switching comes from delays in communication. So if I'm working on project A, and then I have a question, it goes over the wall to the client, and what do you do? Go for coffee or start another card? And then you can work on that until you have a question. Um, you, you always go for the coffee. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be a lot of coffee. <laughs> always go for the coffee. But um, that's where a lot of the context switching comes from, certainly from my experience where you are waiting for feedback from a client so you've got other tasks on the boil at the same time. Um, but that's, again, where the sweeper role does help because they can do that initial triage, ask the questions, and move on. They may not be working on that ticket, but they can come back to, or you know, when the information comes in, they can then send it out to somebody else who will be actually working on it. So whilst it's a place that does definitely have its challenges, there's 
a lot of satisfaction to be had um, in the support world because on a project build team, you might not see your work realized for six months, whereas we will crank out new features every day. And then you'll get the praise from the client every day. And that feels good. You, you get that sense of accomplishment of something's done and ticked off and live. And if you like that, then come talk to me. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to be said for the email from the client that goes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, you're a star, with lots of exclamation marks. That feels good. The other thing that you have to be uh, aware of in the support team is avoiding burnout. And I know there's a session later on today, I think it's half past 11 on mm -hmm. re building resilience in your team and burnout, which is probably worth going to. Uh, but with the, with the support and, team... And, and one at and one on 20, 20 to 6? Is it? When's yours, yeah. David? Uh, at 20 to 6, yeah. The, la the last slot on burnout and uh, imposter syndrome. But the, where was I going? The, with the support team, with all the clients and all the sites, there's a huge backlog of stuff to be done. And all of it is semi-urgent, maybe needs to be done sooner rather than later. You, you, it's difficult for people sometimes to switch off, to step away and go, I'm done for the day. I don't need to look at 10 more tickets or whatever it is. And I think it's just being aware of that that things can wait till tomorrow, unless the site is offline and the house is burning down, it can wait. Yeah. Um, the other thing to mention, I suppose, is the possibility of feeling isolated, particularly in a distributed environment, because we all work remotely. Um, but well, yeah, you can feel overwhelmed by the vast array of projects and styles of site and code bases. Um, but you do have to remember that there is a team there to help. And with measures like the bat signal channel, you feel like the rest of the team then has your back some more. So it's less pressure on you, which you also feels have really good. Flashback Friday. We also have Flashback Friday. So this is another new measure. Uh, that we put in place because we're all techies. We don't really like phone calls. So we try and keep daily stand-ups out of our lives. Um, so on a Friday, for half an hour, we have a scrum-like call. Or a support group call. Yeah. <laughs> so, so it's the format is a thing that went well during the week and a thing that could have gone better during the week. And everybody comes up with two things. And the idea is, first, so that we can just know what people have worked on that was cool. And secondly, so that we can identify areas for improvement um, and then work on them to make our lives better, be it automate something or introduce some <coughs> testing or uh, the concept of Flashback Friday itself. Um, but it's, it's working too. So I'm conscious that we're running out of time. Um, and I think we could probably stand here for another half hour and keep on talking. But is there any last point you want to make or we throw it out to the floor for questions? I need more people, so come talk to me. But otherwise, <laughs> I was wondering: Do you have a specific uh, team for support and another team for doing project work? Or do you yeah, mix so um, maybe I wasn't totally clear on that at the beginning. But when we won that project in 2013, which was a sink or die moment, um, or sink or live, fly, whatever, um, we did like it was just Anthony on that team, and then it grew to two people, and then two years ago it went from two to seven. Um, and they are fully dedicated to support and retain your clients. And the project teams are protected from all those little itsy bitsy requests from retainer clients. 
So when you deliver a project built by your project members, is there a kind of an information sharing moment? There is a handover, there is documentation. Cannot yeah. say enough about having documentation. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a handover process uh, and a transition from the project team to the support team. I won't say that we have it fully polished yet, because sometimes there's warranty sold as part of the project and there's sort of a gray area there as to when exactly is it fully in support versus still dealing with the project team. But mm -hmm. And because, the other thing is, because all our sites that we build internally are standardized and we have a starter kit and this, this a way of doing things, the Anertech way, then, you know, it's easy enough to yeah, take out once those sites. we have an up-to-date readme file in the project route, mm -hmm. we're happy. We don't always get it. And, and then when, when uh, support tickets lead to a mini project, like 40 hours, 80 hours, is that done by the support team as well, or goes it back to the... Generally and ideally, it's done by the support team. I'll ring, ring fence one or two developers to get that finished. Yeah. Uh, occasionally, we're just too busy with casual extras. Yeah. Um, because as I mentioned, some clients don't care about their subscription. They just want more, which is great. Uh, so occasionally, we'll get... Um, a couple of, of the more available developers from outside our team in. But generally the support team would have the capacity to take on a mini project, you know, in a shorter time frame than a project team or a project developer would be. Because they're on projects for two, three, six months. They're they're locked away essentially. Whereas you've a bit more flexibility in that your projects normally last le less than a day like the tickets. Yeah, like the, the subscriptions add up to about 450 hours a month. We can do between 600 and 800 hours a month normally. So there's room for extras, mini projects, and whatever happens. Any more questions? Okay, well, we'll leave it there. We're out of time anyway. Uh, so if you do have any more questions, if you want to come up, talk to me or Anthony afterwards, feel free to do so. We are also hiring for the support team. Uh, so yes, please do come by and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you all for listening. <laughs> one, one more thing, we did actually prepare slides. Um, so we will upload them somewhere, and there is text on the slides too. We just never... Oh, and flick to the contribution one. It's not up on the screen anymore. Oh, well, okay. Come to the contribution thing tomorrow. And come to trivia night. <laughs>